Hello, it's Jason Kendall. I'm here to talk to you about Mars exploration. So getting to Mars. Now, let's just put it this way. Mars is a hard place to visit. As you can see from this from this image or this uh, this complete composite of many, many images of Mars, there's no oceans. The atmosphere is extraordinarily thin. Uh, the, at, the planet itself is not even half as big as the Earth, so the gravity is less. It's just a completely hostile place. But people want to go there, and it's an amazing place to dream about going. And NASA has gotten a new directive from the Obama administration to try to get people to orbit Mars in 2030 and possibly land people in 2040. So let's see some of the pitfalls and problems that could possibly happen by going to Mars. So getting to Mars is rocket science. And so we got to pull out all our rockets and see what it's like getting to getting there. And the thing about getting to rocket science is there's basically three destinations that we've been thinking about. The first one is low Earth orbit, or just above the Earth. The other next one is getting to the moon, and finally we'll see what it's like getting to Mars. But let's first talk about low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit, we know have a lot of experience with, with the International Space Station. You know, it's a space station thing the size of a couple football fields, and it's an amazing, amazing facility. NASA spends three to four billion dollars on it annually to help keep it floating, and other nations assist us with the, uh, it's why it's called the International Space Station. We're doing experiments and learning how what it's like living up in space. So, but low Earth orbit isn't really space. It's falling around the Earth. You're falling around the Earth at an altitude of about 250 miles. So, if you get a I get a tracking device, uh, a tracking app on your phone, which is called like International Space Station uh, uh, ISS uh, followers, then you can actually find and watch it rising and setting over your horizon on because it orbits the Earth every 90 minutes. So, but it's orbiting the Earth. We're not talking space. So we call them astronauts. Really, we're fallenauts because they're falling around the Earth at 250 miles up. And this is from Newton's laws. And the reason it falls around the Earth is that basically, as you think about, this is Newton's diagram from a long time ago. We have a, uh, have a big mountain. Imagine you have a cannon on top of the mountain. And if you shoot the cannon ball, it'll land. It'll go very, very far, but it'll land uh, uh, as it falls towards the Earth at the letter D. So if you shoot it even further, the curvature there starts to become a problem. And if you shoot it very far, you get to the letter F. But if you keep shooting it faster and faster with a faster muzzle velocity, eventually you find that actually as it falls, it's going laterally around so fast that basically it doesn't hit the Earth. So orbiting the planet is simply going fast enough so that as you fall towards the Earth, you don't actually hit. So that speed is about 17,000 miles an hour. You're about 20,000 miles an hour for rounding up. So here's the thing about space travel in general. 99 out of 100 is an F on your exam because one thing goes wrong, everybody dies. It's pretty simple. So another way to talk about this is, is make sure you do everything right or a million ways to die. So. This would be wonderful to go to Mars and go to places and get around, get around the SS Enterprise. And so we have this thing which has been coming through for us for a long period of time, but we don't have that. We have this, or at least we did, and it's been decommissioned. We have the Space Shuttle. But the Space Shuttle has amazing, amazing engines that provide huge amounts of thrust that can, that can lift enormous payloads and send it up to the International Space Station, but it can't get to Mars Mar or, even, or even the moon. But when we went to the moon, this is the, cut, this is the great picture from Christmas Eve uh, that, that stunned the world many, many years ago in the 60s. So the moon, however, is, our, is one of the most interesting destinations that humanity has ever gone to. Now, how do we get to the moon? Well, let's look at the distance. It's not 250 miles up. It's 240,000 miles away. That's really big. The Earth's only 8,000 miles away, so it's many, many Earth diameters far. So getting there, is, I mean, the distance isn't that far because, you know, we can drive a car 200,000 miles and rockets can get us there pretty good. It's the speed with which you get there. So let's look at the total amount of speed that it takes to fly there. Because what you got to do is you got to get there, you got to get, go as fast as you can, slow down, land, and then come back and speed up and then come back. So to get into Earth orbit, you need to go 20,000 miles an hour. And this is the uh, Apollo mission. This is Apollo 11 lifting off. 
Now, once you get into low Earth orbit, you need an additional 8,000 miles an hour to kick you out of orbit such that you can go on your way to the moon. And once you get to the moon, you've got to slow down really hard. So you've got to de uh, decelerate by 2,000 miles an hour so that you can be captured by the moon. And then you have to slow, and then so you can go into moon lunar orbit. Then you have to descend by 3,900 miles an hour in order to get to the surface of the moon. And once you land, you do your last bits of jetting down at 700 miles an hour, and you land, say hello, say hello to the president, President Nixon, salute, salute the flag, and then do your stuff, get on, get some rocks, and then come home. 700 miles an hour to launch off the surface of the moon, 3,900 miles an hour in order to get yourself into a proper orbital trajectory, 2,400 miles an hour to leave the lunar orbit, and then you don't have to do anything in order to, you don't have to expend anything in order to come into your atmosphere because you have the atmosphere. It slows you down, so you don't have to do that speed. So then you also don't have to worry about landing either uh, after, after you come into the Earth's atmosphere because you can use parachutes in order to land yourself. So the total change in speed that you've got to be able to do for the spacecraft to go from the Earth to landing on the moon and then back is 42,000 miles an hour. That's the total sum of all the di differences in speed. Okay, so now let's look at what we did. Look at this enormous, enormous, enormous rocket. The only thing that came back is what you see on the right. It's a very, very small part. Everything else was used up, destroyed, in the getting of these people there and back. Well, that thing weighed about six tons. The lunar capsule that returned back to Earth weighed six tons. And with three people on board, they had 33 cans of air, four uh, big jugs of water, which they eh, kind of recycled, and about one basket of food because they knew they were going to be gone for only about a week or so, and that's pretty good for what they're going to do. So let's see what it takes in order the equivalent thing in order to get to Mars. Okay, big, super heavy lift vehicle going 20,000 20, miles an hour. Once you get into Earth orbit, you then kick yourself off by going an additional 9,000 miles an hour. Notice that's not much more than going to the moon, which is really interesting. Now, the good thing is, is Mars has an atmosphere, so you can use aerobraking in order to descend into the atmosphere. And then, well, you really can't use parachutes on Mars because Mars's atmosphere is so very thin that you'd actually crash and die. I mean, Curiosity had to use parachutes, but it only slowed it down to 200 miles an hour, and that would thing only weighed a ton. It's going to weigh a lot more stuff, so you can't use parachutes to descend. You have to use rockets. So you have to use a big, big, big rocket to land you on the surface of Mars. And once you do, you can wander around, set up cars, be amazed at all the red rocks, uh, collect samples, um, find, <laughs> find really interesting things to do, look at the scenery, write texts home to your loved ones, and then time to go home. And you have to launch off the surface of Mars at 17,000 miles an hour. Now notice that's almost the same as getting off the Earth. So this is an interesting trick. It's not much, so you basically have almost the same lifting power that you need to, for the Apollo missions in order to get off, which is a lot of work. Okay, so 17,000 miles an hour, enormous lift rocket to get off, off of Mars. And when you finally get home, you can use the Earth's atmosphere to descend and then parachute in. And then finally, the total change is not much more than you get from going to the moon and back. So it's really not much more. So it's really not the speed, it's the distance. Mars is really far. It's much further than the moon. Let's see how far. Okay, so let's zoom out, zoom out, zoom out. Okay, we're gonna put this little dashed line to demonstrate where the, the moon's orbit is, about a half a million miles across. So we keep going and going and going and going. And now we can't even see the Earth. We only see this little tiny thing over here. Keep going, keep going. Okay, wait a minute, what's that? Ah, that's Venus's orbit on the left. Venus's orbit is 26 million miles away. Let's keep going, because we're not to Mars yet. Oh, Mercury's kind of sneaking in there. The sun's in there. Okay, where's, oh, red, there we go. We got some Mars action. Let's eliminate the other two, because we're not worried about them. We're not going to use them. And so what we got is that the average distance between the Earth and the sun is 93 million miles, but the average distance between the sun and Mars is 140 million miles. The Earth goes around once every 12 months, and Mars goes around every two and a half, 22 and a half months, so the years are different. So can we cut straight across? 
we just say, hey, let's get right across. Boom, boom, boom. Let's use a really fast rocket to get across. That would cost you 250,000 miles an hour or faster in order to do that. And that's called, you know, the Enterprise, and we ain't got that, so let's keep going. So we have to actually have to do something we call a transfer orbit. And basically, you fire your rockets, and what you want to do is you want to end up, you'd make an elliptical orbit that intersects with Mars's orbit at the destination. So the total orbit transfer time, if you went just on one of these orbits, is 17 months. That's how long it takes to do the whole transfer orbit. Okay, let's do a transfer orbit to Mars. So, oh, wait a second, you can't boomerang around. That's what Apollo 13 did when they had that huge, huge, huge problem. They basically aborted, swung around the moon, and came home. You can't do that with Mars. Let's see why. Okay, so little blue dot is the Earth. A little white dot is a little spacecraft that's going to Mars, and a little red dot is Mars. So we're going to do some step-by-step -step things and see how we get to Mars. So let's go. Month zero, month one, month two, month three, month four, month five, month six, month seven, month... Hey, eight and a half months. We got out to Mars's orbit, but Mars isn't there. Whoops, we're embarrassed. That's not good. We missed Mars. Well, let's make it home. Okay, let's get back home. You know, take this transfer orbit. 17 months, we're going to make it. Okay, let's go. So let's keep going back home because we missed Mars and Mars is overtaking us and wow, we got a problem. So 17 months later, the Earth is not back there. So we're dead. So basically, if you just swing out there and just try it any old time, you're not going to make it. You have to wait till things are aligned properly. Okay, so let's do that right there. All right, so we wait till Mars is going to be in the right place so we get it, so we line it up there. So boom, let's go. Boom, 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 boom. Now we're heroes. We made it to Mars. We swing around Mars a couple of times saying, now let's go home. Let's immediately depart. All right, so we immediately depart and we come home and we're still dead. Oh, wait, the Earth. We forgot about the Earth. Oh, that's no good. So let's set this all up. Let's play the game so that first Mars is in the right place, and then we have to wait until the Earth is in the right place. So here we go. Start again. Bum, 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 bum. Eight and a half months to get there. And now we ride Mars. We have to take a trip along with Mars, because we're on Mars, until we're at the right place, such that we can do another transfer orbit home. 23 and a half months. It's left Earth two years ago. Now we can depart Mars and do another transfer orbit back home. 32 months. Two transfer orbits, riding Mars, for, well, 32 minus 17 is a lot of time. It's 15 months on Mars, so that's a long time. So let's see what we can do. What does that take to do a three-year round trip? Well, it seems like from uh, what many people are doing and with the, with the high seas program, we're trying to simulate what it means for people to be so isolated for three years and not go crazy. Let's see what, it seems like the optimal crew complement is about six people. Well, now you need 9,000 canisters of air because you got to bring it all with you because Mars doesn't have it, doesn't have oxygen. It has carbon dioxide and it's very, very thin. You need all the water you can possibly have. So six people are going to have 1,100 gallons of those, those things that you see there, which is basically about, I think, about 10 of those trucks that go to uh, corporate locations. And 20, 280 trips to Costco which is a pretty lot, a lot, about a lot of groceries. So all that's about 420 tons, which is the current mass of the space station, the International Space Station. Okay, so what did it take to build the space station? Well, 26 shuttle launches and about four, a couple of Russian launches and a couple of, your, uh, couple of other large heavy lift, a couple of uh, Russian launches. So you got to recycle or else you're not going to make it. And, well, nothing can break. In three years, not a single thing can go wrong. Does that sound likely? It's tricky. It's very hard to do. So let's pretend like nothing goes wrong for three years at all on the International Space Station. Ask any astronaut who's been there. Things go wrong frequently, but they fix them. They do their best. They got lots of spare parts. But there's nobody to kind of send a shuttle up anymore. Nobody else can help you. So you have to take everything with you. So... The hundred tons of stuff that you need to take to go round trip to Mars. You need a really big ship. 
not a small ship, a really big ship, because you've got to do 100 tons there. Now, 6 tons is 3,350 tons, which is the weight of the Apollo mission. So if you want to do 100 tons, what's the weight and mass of the ship, meaning fuel in order to drive that tonnage? And then what's the spacecraft going to be? It's going to be 85,000 tons of spacecraft to drive the 100 tons that you need to drive. That's the USS Nimitz. That's an aircraft carrier. So basically, we've got to build the USS Nimitz in space. That's a big ship. And all of it, the entire thing, is going to be used up in order to send these people to Mars. Okay, well, 85,000 tons. We can do 39 shuttle missions, 25 Apollo missions. Yeah, that's going to be kind of tricky, ain't it? 25 Apollo missions. Well, we're not going to build... We're not going to build anything like the uh, like uh, like HAL 9000 or the or the Discovery anytime soon. So we're going to have to think smaller. We have to think much more cheaply. We have to figure out ways to land robots and help them build things on our own and recycle and create materials for us, or even build or even take robotic objects that land on there and actually robotic habitats, perhaps. But now let's talk about some really weird stuff that happens. Physiography, physiology is going to be very tricky on Mars. So the thing is, is that Mars, if you're in space for too long, you lose muscle mass. It's well known that if you're up in space, you're not, you're not going to be, uh, you're not going to be resisting gravity. So you get weaker and weaker and weaker. So, well, the International Space Station, they've learned about that. They've studied it. So they do weight training and resistance training. So they understand how to do that. That's good. Another thing that happens is that the, your, your sense of balance has a really big problem because your ear is, helps you figure out which way is up. So basically, to help you with that so you don't get all spinny head, is you sit around a lot too in the International Space Station. It's pretty important. The more you move, the more you wiggle, the more unbalanced you get and you get quite sick. So basically, check yourself out, have a nice, lot of nice time looking out the windows, don't move too fast because they'll spin you around. Basically, be a little lazy, too. All right. And here's the biggest problem in my mind, is that the sun gives off solar flares and coronal mass ejections all the time, even in quiescent times. And that radiation can cause enormous problems. Likewise, if a supernova occurs nearby, like with Betelgeuse explodes, um, even if it doesn't, there's cosmic rays that come throughout the solar system from, from supernovae that may have occurred mil tens of thousands of years ago or a thousand years ago that we haven't seen, but the cosmic rays are following the magnetic field lines of the galaxy and eventually intersect us with the sun. And these cosmic rays can cause damage. So radiation kills. And the radiation kills you hard. So you got to have something to block it. But you can't use lead. So what are you going to do? Are you going to carry all this lead? No, that's not good because it just adds mass, makes your spaceship bigger, which means you got a bigger spaceship and to have any have to have more mass, so it's a big problem. So how about some other crazy way? Maybe you just use all the water you bring as, as a shield. That could be good, but then, well, I don't know. This is a tricky call. Exactly how you protect yourself against space radiation while in space is a very difficult thing. The curiosity uh, took along with it uh, radiation detectors while it was in transit to determine exactly how much radiation was gotten. And interestingly enough, uh, people could have survived it according to radiation. But then it didn't get hit by a lot of CMEs or, or random cosmic rays. So it's kind of a crapshoot when you go, but you got to have some shielding or else you have a problem. Well, the biggest problem is that bone loss happens to all astronauts. So all astronauts experience bone loss. Why? Because you're not in gravity. And bones hold you up against gravity. So that's what their function is. If you don't need it, your body says, hey, I don't need to make all this calcium for the bones. And so basically, all astronauts start to get osteoporosis. So maybe a really huge side benefit for going to Mars will be, the, will be necessitating a cure for osteoporosis. Now that's an amazing idea. And that's really worth it. It'll be a huge, huge, huge benefit for people back home. So... Maybe this will help. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, she ran the uh, Boston Marathon while up in the International Space Station. Maybe others could do similar things. Maybe that'll help with osteoporosis, but it's not well known exactly how to cure the bone loss that does occur to all astronauts. And finally, will you go crazy? Six people in a can, in a small environment for 32 months, 
even if you're the most important people in the world because everybody's looking at you, everybody's hanging out on your every word, you might go crazy. So what do you do about that? Oh, and there's other, some other some fun stuff like this. Okay, so astronauts also get, because blood pressure is designed in a gravitational field, the pressure from your feet pushing up actually would send blood up to your brain. So astronauts frequently experience enlargement of their brain and enlargement and swelling of their eyeballs because of the pressure that their that the lower extremities have in pushing blood back up to the upper portion of their bodies. So you get higher blood pressure in your brain. So this can cause problems. That's a big problem. Anyway, International Space Station has been uh, has been an enormous enormous help in order to study how people actually live in space. And rocket scientists are trying to help actually people get to Mars today. There are numerous things that people are trying to do. There are enormous difficulties in getting to Mars, but yet people are trying to surmount them so that to try to do it. And it's a it's an incredible adventure with huge things to overcome. But maybe, maybe we will go to Mars in 2030, send people to orbit, and maybe send another group after that to land in 2040. Mars is pretty cool. It's probably the next place that people will colonize, hopefully in the uh, next hundred years, and it will be a place where we could live if we could terraform Mars and make it warm enough to have oceans once again like it did three and a half billion years ago. But there are enormous technological challenges and it would be amazing to try to do them and try to conquer them. So, Mars, here we come.